Hello, and welcome to a narrative of love, a series of conversations on conceptions and the practices of love from a multidisciplinary perspective. I am Chateau Gill, and I invite thinkers, writers, and the practitioners into this dialogic space and explore what love means and how love might be embraced in our personal and public lives. Hello and welcome. Today with me on Zoom is David Geffen, the founder of Loving Classroom. David, tell me a little bit about the inspiration behind this Loving Classroom movement. Um, apart from the fact that the inspiration for love is in the air wherever you go anyway, and I had very loving parents and I got a fabulous wife and I speak to people like you and I'm surrounded by loving people. Um, the actual uh, point where I started this particular journey in life was in the mid nineties in Israel uh, when the peace process was in full swing. But I saw, and sadly, and I live in Israel and it's embarrassing to say, it's uncomfortable to say because this was a lovely place and if you want to come and visit you'll love it and um, there are many good things but I saw that the Prime Minister was going to be assassinated a good year before it happened not because I had any inside information but because of the palpable hatred in the media on the street um, even in the Knesset which is the Houses of Parliament in Israel it was so heavy I saw it was going to happen so I tried to get the left and right to talk to each other and it was too late. We're still buying paper clips and getting our official confirmation for uh, setting up an organization done when it happened. Uh, but afterwards, I said, wherever there's fighting between groups, and it started off within Israel. Of course, we have a global vision, but, you know, if you don't make peace at home, you can't make peace in the world type of thing. So where there were certain groups fighting each other, whether it's left and right or religious and secular, sometimes it gets very intense here. And we've tasted that intensity of political religious fighting in the world, but it's very much so in Israel, sadly. And wherever there were physical fights between the two sides, I wanted to get involved and try and get involved in conflict resolution to stop that fighting. Um, and we went to, uh, there's a certain street in Jerusalem called Barilan Street, and it's in the middle of a religious secular neighborhood where they meet. And the question was, should the road be open or closed on the Sabbath? The religious Jews want it closed. You don't do anything on the Sabbath. And the secular Jews said, well, it's our access point. And they would fight every week. And there was stone throwing. And there was blood. And there was fighting. And there was cars being bombarded and backwards and forwards. And I'm not blaming this side or the outside. It was just a fight. And I was sitting on the couch moaning about this. And my wife said, you know we should stop moaning and do something about it oh yeah so we employed five we employed one person from each of the sides just part-time it was very easy not very expensive and i said please bring five of your leaders along and we'll meet we met for 25 times um and through that process we came up with a compromise and then implemented the compromise and to this day that road is peaceful. Do we take 100% of the credit? No. 0%? No. Oh, we'll take 50-60%. It was part of a big system and we were involved. And to this day, it's um, amazing. It's just like at peace. And then we were called into other places to make peace and we did so successfully. But the problem was every time we put out a fire here, there's two there. And you put out two there and there's another like two, four there. It's just like, and so you have one day of like, wow, that's worth living. And then Oh, I didn't really make a difference. And that's like, and we want to make a difference. We want peace in, in Israel, in the world. So we realized we had to, to somehow create a society which could do what we're doing, which, um, so how do you do that? And that brought us to the schools because the vast majority of human beings go to school. Um, and then at that point, there's so many hours to practice what we're doing because what we were doing was basically listening to each other, appreciating each other's position, having compassion for each other, building respect. So all these like slogans, we could convert them into a curriculum. So instead of us using them to solve problems, we wanted to work in pre what I call uh, preemptive medicine as opposed to emergency medicine. And that is going to the schools and, and training the students with the skills we were using. And since the common denominators 
you know, everybody believes in the words respect, compassion, listening, you know, wherever you go, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, we all use, or atheist or whatever, we use the words. So they're sort of like politically correct. So every curriculum should theoretically accept these ideas. So we got people from all backgrounds to come up with workshops so that the wording was also universal and it wouldn't be too religious or too secular or too this or too that, too right, too left, but it was something which sort of like could be a common denominator for all, which is what we initially called the organization for all these different um, groups. And we started teaching in Jerusalem schools and we actually saw a reduction in violence and bullying and an increase in academic results because kids wanted to turn up to the schools and uh, they actually had good time at school and, and did their homework and liked their teacher and things went well. So then the mayor of Kiryat Gat said, would you do all the high schools in Kiryat Gat? And we saw similar results there. It was amazing. And even Zava Gur, who's the head of education in Kiryat Gat, reported that normally in Israel, uh, you get a certain amount of days you can take for sick leave. And typically it's a tradition here. Teachers take 100% of those days for sick leave, sick leave, whether they're sick or not. It's just done like that. But where we worked, it went down to 65 to 70% because the teachers were also just like enjoying the classroom more. They were just less frustrated. So this was very exciting. But there were two buts. And um, the first but was when we left the school, after about two years, the problems came back. So there's that feeling again, like, I didn't make any difference. Like, what's the point? I mean, for an individual, it's a big point because they have a lovely life. But if you want to have an impact on society, what's the point? And the second thing is we had a massive staff. So if you wanted to expand to the rest of Israel and, and the world, it was just not scalable. So the solution to that problem was, um, the same solution for both problems was to train the teachers. So if you train the teachers, then it becomes part of the ethos of the school. And also if you train the teachers, they're the ones doing the work as it were, and you don't need a massive team because the team of the world's teachers are transmitting the idea of what we now call positive relationship education. So how do we understand love in general? But also I think um, in terms of your own background, you're a rabbi and I don't want to miss the opportunity to explore love in the context of a religious way of religious thought, religious teaching, well, partly because I'm a scholar, but also how does religious life influence your own understanding of love? A deep, a deep understanding of love. I think I'd like to maybe um, take that notion and develop that for a moment. Um, once I was playing guitar, and if you play the note, let's say E, Ding. the sound of E uh, fills the whole room and wherever you are you hear E and actually if there's another guitar in the room or a tuning fork if it's set if there's a string set to play E it starts vibrating all by itself the other strings hardly absorb any energy maybe a little bit but you can't really hear anything but if there's another string set to play E that string starts absorbing the energy and plays all by itself without you touching it I was intrigued. So the other end, the other strings don't get the energy, but that one does. Why? So it's a principle called resonance. Because the string wants to vibrate at the same frequency, um, it picks up the energy without any friction. It wants to be pulled when the airwaves are pulling. It wants to be pushed when the airwaves are pushing. It's the same frequency, so it picks up the energy. So that is interesting. The energy of E is everywhere in the room, but only the string set to E will, it, will absorb that energy. So since you asked it from a religious perspective, the energy of God's everywhere in the room. And I can walk through the room, and if I'm not set to his note, I can like, just walk through like those strings that are not set to the note and just not absorb anything. But I'd like to be set to his note so that I absorb that energy of life and explore what are that wonderful experience of being alive like so what's god's note and i you know look through the whole of the i call it, you call it old testament five books of moses to find out what's the definition of god in his words from the five books of moses what is god's note 
And you go through the whole thing. And actually in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, you'll find that God defines himself. And this is his note. Here's the crescendo. It says, God is, his note's coming, one. And I suddenly realized then that spirituality is an experience of one because God is one. But that means that you and I, in an appropriate way, have to be one. But not just you and I, but you and I and them. And But not just you and I and them, but you and I and them. And then you realize it's the whole world has to be one. And the more we experience that oneness, the more we experience this fabulous feeling of life. That's a spiritual experience of oneness is this tingle of love. So we were in the classroom and, I, and we were explaining what we called the four H methodologies. The first H is what we call the humanity being. And it's another way of expressing oneness. It's the top level. Just like a human being is all these different parts and limbs and organs working together in harmony. So too the humanity being is all the different parts of humanity working together in harmony. That is a fabulous model. The model of the body is a model for humanity and in fact of all existence. And then three more H's are head, heart and hand. Head, how can I communicate with every part of the humanity being? Heart, how can I crave the well-being of every part of the humanity being? And then hand, practically speaking, how can I do for the humanity being? And it's actually very interesting not to do... It's, the order is very important because if you get involved in hand, Sometimes you can end up doing things which hurt the humanity being. It's very important, first of all, to have this overall consciousness. So wherever I walk, you're talking about love. I'm just in love um, with everything because I feel that oneness because I, rec I just realize we're one soul. So I'm definitely walking around with the buzz of we are one. And that breaks down all, all I can't tell you, there's tons of anecdotes, but it breaks down all the walls. Um, I, that's my being it, my experience. It's really interesting because if you think about this, the three H's, the head, the heart, the hand. But one could say, well, you're dividing human beings into parts. But then you said, no, because there's a humanity. So this is not really dividing, but when really looking at the different perspectives. But by, by the humanity age, you actually stress, further em um, emphasize the importance of the, we, the system. We can only see one as an integral, yeah. integral oneness. And then you can then expand that oneness and broadly. And that's really beautiful, I think. So tell me, when you first introduce this kind of four H's into the teacher training program, how do they receive it? I will answer that um, um, in a, that next time around. I want to say one more thing about love, which is important based on what you're saying. And, and therefore, you can say without that higher level of H, I, I'll ask you a question. Is love good or bad? Hmm? What's your answer? Love is, is I think, in, in a sense that in terms of the way that you describe it, love is being itself. So love is I, God, love is being itself. So you cannot stand outside of being and then make a judgment of good or bad. Okay, well, I love, I love your answer. So um, typically I'll say it, it depends because, um, and, I'll, and, and I, I love, I think what you answered, I resonate with a uh, great answer. Um, what, what I was aiming at is the following, that uh, sometimes we can love somebody, let's say I'm learning to become a doctor and I'm, I'm learning from this doctor how to build hospitals. And I love him and he's so wise and sensitive. So I write down everything he says and I'm going to build this fantastic hospital and, and save lives. That's a beautiful love. But I also could be loving a dictator that wants to take over the world and blast the heck out of... Uh, and I love him and he stands for justice and honesty and we're going to destroy everybody that's in our way and i'm writing down everything he says i'm going to put that into action 
So that's a love which is not taking into account the humanity being. So the word love or listening or care or trust, all those words are actually very, it's how you apply it. And it's very important before delving into trying to define those words or understanding them or building a curriculum to start off with this global sense of oneness and being living in it. And, and then the words one chooses to define the terms are always in context of the system, which is what you were describing. And um, that's an important point that it starts with the H and then you can get down to their heart and hand and then bring them together. We have two virtues for each of these four H's. So for humanity being, we teach respect and compassion. Respect, seeing the goodness, knowing there's goodness everywhere. Compassion, how to deal with the weaknesses that we also have as well. For head, we have listening and kindness. Listening, obviously, that's for communication. Why do you need kindness? Because in this day and age, if, you're, if there's not a kind atmosphere in the room, then people are too scared to talk. And you could be the best listener in the world, but if they're not talking, there's no communication. So if somebody's scared to say, I like Trump, or I like Clinton, or, and they're just too scared because they know they're going to be blasted one way or the other, or I like this religious idea, or I like this secular idea, they're going to be blasted and they keep quiet. There's no communication. So kindness is very much part of the communication process. So it's listening and kindness. Um, then comes heart, which is gratitude and love. And action, hand, is care caring for people within the school and uh, sorry friendship and care friendship is like taking a certain personal responsibility for the people we know and making sure they never uh, are lonely in life and then care for the bigger picture of the world and we link that then to the united nations and the sdgs of unesco etc etc and link different classes and countries and so on so forth so um in doing that we have we have different tools to make each of those eight values virtues um, real. So, for example, for the virtue of kindness, we have an exercise whereby we ask people to write a note, and people can do this at home. Um, I could do this now with you if we had the time, but we haven't set it up for that. But just write a note to somebody that maybe, like, you're a wonderful spirit. So, me, I'm not like that, but maybe somebody that you're not having a difficult time communicating with. Um, I, you know, there's a bit of a challenge. Maybe they're a bit frustrating. They're not listening. They're a bit like not respectful or something's going wrong between the thing. Write a short note to fix the problem. And they write a short note. And after minutes or two, then you show them a bunch of beautiful pictures of the world. And you ask them, which is your favorite picture? And then describe why. Oh, it just makes me feel so oh, calm, loving. It just, I just love that picture. And they're in that zone. And then you ask them, please write another note to the same person you chose before, but this time write it with the energy of that picture. And invariably, 90% of the times, it's incredible that the first one is very judgmental. It's like, you know, I really think that you should pay a little bit more attention to, da, 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 as opposed to the second one, which is much more like, oh, I just, um, I feel we could have a great time. And if it ever works out, I look forward to getting together and we're talking it through and, and I'm sure we'll, you know, and it's just not judgmental. It's very loving. So and, what, what, what's happening there? Just, just think about this. So, um, what happens uh, there? Yeah. Beauty, beauty, aesthetics and, and an uplifting image somehow transpose transport ourselves into, into a oneness. new ah a new into a oneness, oneness. Okay. I'd be very and that's in fact you have harmony the harmony of notes or a harmony of a, a chord in music or a harmony of an orchestra and the story they tell when they tell the whole music song it is all about oneness there's a, a system it lifts you to feel oneness um i can go into deep depth about that at some point but that's what happens and I know that once they're in a oneness zone, when they start writing, they'll be writing with the energy of oneness. And, and that's got to be uh, connecting as opposed to judgmenting, uh, yeah. judging. And yeah. tell me what happened in, in after the first group of teacher being trained, what happened to their life and classrooms?
And I call myself a love engineer because on one side, it's this gooey oneness that we're all one, da, da, da. but it's engineering. And I'm an engineer as well, a computer engineer. It's step by step. You can learn ideas and practice them. And we have to practice them, by the way. It's like tennis. If you don't you know, learn it from the book, you know that. But in, in the classroom, there's so many hours you can practice all the things that you're learning as a natural thing. So that that's the way it affected the teachers. And then um, just talking about the students' response, I came back to the same school three months later, and I was very worried about the word love, um, because as you said before, people like, I, I, many people in my family um, really blasted me for saying the word love. You, you can't use that. It's like people will take it the wrong way. It, it's bad marketing. David, you don't understand anything about marketing. And I was like, in the end, I decided, I mean, I believe love is the glue of all humanity. That's what I'm doing. And if I fail using the word, I'd rather sync with who I am than survive pretending I'm somebody else. So I decided to cancel out the word a little bit by saying loving classroom it makes it a little bit less threatening. So I asked the kids I, for many a year or two, I was asking, do, do you think I should change the title loving classroom to like positive relationship education? P-R-E, pre. -E, pre. Um, and they said, oh no. So one girl in this class, there's about 15 of them, 16 of them. She puts her hand up. Uh, her name was Deborah. And she said, please don't change the name because I, want, I think I'm speaking for almost everybody in this class, but for sure for me, I don't think I've ever felt loved in my life. And this is the first time I've ever felt love. So the, it's not just for the kids, it's for the teachers as well. It's, we all need it. And myself, if ever I'm in an argument with my wife, we've been married happily for 38 years, but you know, we're a married couple, we get into a little bit of a, uh, and Nomi will say to me, is this the way you should be talking according to loving classroom? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh, okay, I give up. As <laughs> we have to practice, and I'm 60 years old, so it's a process of mastering the tools, but we do become more, more adept at playing tennis better the more we practice. But you are, basically you're saying that the training for teachers is for them to actually experience the kind of activities that you're going to then, they will facilitate with the children in the classroom. Yes. So they have, have it firsthand. So they know it from inside out of what it means. Absolutely. Loving classroom is an experience. Yes. It's, kind of, it's a human experience rather than just a, a so-called a set of classroom. We learn about the virtues and then we we'll practice, but it's actually in experiencing this. Yes. Yeah. Intellectual, emotional, and practical experience. Yes, yes. All That's levels of experience. Now, tell me, you have introduced this in Israel, in the UK, and in South Africa. Where do you start? How do you end? How do you, how, where is the door that you knock on in order to enter into the system? Um, I think the first thing when you're starting up a country is to find somebody that lives this loving classroom energy, that is a loving engineer, that is a love engineer. And in South Africa, um, it's a long story, but a chap called Tulani contacted me and I met Tulani and um, he's just the most amazingly wonderful human being. And he said, David, we need loving classroom in South Africa. Um, if not, um, there may be a civil uh, uh, sort of civil war here. Not, I'm not talking between blacks and whites, blacks and blacks. Um, it's just um, we need loving classroom. And I would like to give my life to making it happen here. So that's a love engineer who's totally and absolutely dedicated to the idea of bu building a loving world. That is the center of setting up a country or an area. If you don't have that central um, love engineer, then everything else sort of like falls apart. But, and, and there, in every country you go, you'll find love engineers. They, they, they turn up, there's not lots of them. Um, one day they'll be the standard, but they're everywhere. And, but Tulani is remarkable. He's a massive guy, but he's so wise and so loving and such a cuddly bear. And I remember the first time we met, it was um, at an event. He was volunteering, actually, 
because we had this little stall and not enough. There were so many people. We needed somebody to volunteer to deal with the crowd. And after about two hours were of handing out books and everything, he, he's based in South Africa and I come from Israel. And he said, David, I want you to know, I never say this normally, but I really love you. And um, I love the book. And I love um, the fact um, that that you're trying to sort of bring it to the schools. I want to, I really love it. I'm totally in love with you, but I've got a very difficult question to ask you. Do you mind if I ask you a difficult question? And I'm like, okay. And then he had all these questions that he had to ask about Israel and its political policies and the Palestinian conflict, this, that, and the other. And he like, and they were very difficult questions. And some of them I felt were fair and some of them like niggled me a bit, like made me feel like, oh, that's not a fair question. You know, I was attaching, attacking me, not, not that I was, you know, taking it too personally, but it was like they were hard questions. And then I remembered in the book, it says before responding, remember the good qualities of the person you're talking to so that it's a good, loving response. So even though I was feeling a bit uptight, I thought I've got to go through some of his good qualities and it's part of the intellectual process. So what good qualities does he have? I just met him. I just met him two hours ago. And if you hear the story, I described his good qualities. It's the most amazing thing he did. Before asking hard questions, he told me how much he loved me, how much he loved the book, how much he loved the course. What a fabulous human being to make me feel appreciated and worth it before asking his difficult question. He was the essence of a love engineer. And that's before he read the book. He was just such a loving, caring human being. And then I, and then I felt like, wow, thank you for asking those questions. They're gonna make me grow. But first of all, can I give you a hug? Massive guy, give him a hug. And then because I felt that love, I sort of related to the questions on a very different level. Yes, they're difficult questions. Let's go through them and we'll try. And that's what Loving Classroom is trying to change. It was a completely different energy. So finding a Tulani is crucial. Then once you have a Tulani, he then read through the book. He was trained by various people. We have uh, Gemma Perkins in England. She trained him. I trained him. Other people were involved in giving him over. And then he adapted the course um, not or the way to present the course to his local needs. So there's eight months of school in South Africa and he noticed there are eight virtues. So they chose to do one virtue per month and then they made sure that all the subclasses and everything fitted into a month. And that's what they did. And then because he was um, connected to government and everything, he's involved in uh, um, politics, uh, the justice, from the just or social justice point of view, um, he actually made a deal with the local uh, Hauteng Ministry of Education um, that if we can prove ourselves over a three-year testing period, then Loving Classroom will become part of the educational system in Hauteng and from there probably the wall of South Africa. And so they opened up the schools for us and the first year we did 5,800 students. This year we're doing 21,000 students in 58 schools. And next year it's something like 80 schools and close to 100,000 students. But, uh, and the government are evaluating the impact on society. So that's something we always dreamed of because although in the book we have pre and post course evaluation, you know, how good do you think the class is in respect with the definition of respect before and afterwards to see if there's any change, uh, which is great. But I'm just, I'm less interested in statistics in the book and everything, which is, I'm, I want to know if society actually changes. So they came up with these statistics, which I think I sent to you. I can't remember off them part, but off my heart. But I know that stabbings went down, HIV went down, rape went down, which is maybe not such an important issue in English or American schools, but also bullying went down, tribalism went down, and academic results went up. The same thing that happened in Israel at the very beginning story. But this time, it wasn't being done by me. It was being done by Tulani and his staff of five people getting out in that 21,000 kids. And so he has got a connection with the government. So it's becoming part of the government process. He has got, he's trained trainers. So now it's me that trained Gemma, that trained Talan, that trained the trainers, that trained the teachers, that then got to the kids. That's five generations of training. So that's part of the system of engineering. The, the South Africa um, story is, is very moving. And, and I think in a sense that you put from the personal conviction, from personal relationship, there comes 
the next step into schools and from one one teacher who then bring in other teachers and then influencing the the whole system it's very important to slow down so once i was in a classroom and um we were discussing a very very difficult situation of it was like rape and murder and and en masse and it was a very sad scenario and you could hear a pin drop it was very dramatic and then one of the students put his hand up and i said to him oh you have a question and the student said yes i said what's your question and he said what's the price of rotten tomatoes in the marketplace today now I'll ask teachers, how would you answer that? I'm not going to put you on the spot in an interview and saying, how do you answer that? Because that wouldn't be loving. But, you know, if it's not being recorded, I'll say, how would you answer that? And most, most teachers say something. Some teachers would swear, and I've heard that come out. But most of them were like, please, this is very, a painful moment. Let Please take it seriously because these people are suffering. Something like that. Well, if that's what you say, you're actually killing the relationship because what you're saying is because we learn another phrase in the book which is painful behavior comes from people in pain so if that person is asking such a crazy question he must be in pain and instead of relating to the pain if you say to him come on take it seriously this person is you know, in a thousand miles away is in pain. I couldn't care less about your pain. You're just two inches away from me. But this person a thousand miles away is in pain. Um, let's give them the respect and compassion and time needed to understand their story. So if you say something like that, you're actually saying to this person, I don't really care about your pain and let's just move on with the curriculum. I actually, I've got to finish the curriculum because it's, you know, I've got this time schedule for the class and otherwise I won't get to do the other activity. So being aware of that, I, sometimes I catch myself and do it right. And this time I did it right. I actually turned around to him and I said, um, I said, that's the most amazing question I've ever heard. And I'm quite a creative person, but, um, um, where did that question come from? And he thought he was in trouble. So he didn't expect that. So he said, oh, it's nothing, nothing, nothing. And I said, no, please. And I took the book, Loving Classroom. And I said, look, I put a lot of energy into this book and I threw it away in the bin. I said, I'll take it out of the bin later on. I'm not interested in the book anymore. Or I'm just interested in you. I, I think I would spend a year trying to come up with a question like that before I could come up with, it's an amazing question. Where's it come from? And so he's like, because we established kindness, do you remember we put kindness next to listening and communication? There was a nice atmosphere. He said, okay, to be honest with you, I think all this love stuff is a rubbish. I think we, sh we should be learning how to fight wars and we should destroy our enemies and make peace in the world by destroying all that evil. And ha half the class, before I could say anything, my thought was, oh my gosh, that was for the first time a real piece of communication. That was just the pinnacle of my life. I was like actually communicating with another human being. Before I could even get all that out and process it, half the class said, no, 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 oh, da, 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 da. you can do it this way. And the other half goes, no, he's right. And we had the most amazing 25 minute discussion about, about like, is, it, is he right? And at the end, I wasn't looking for points because the points were already scored. What was that? I listened to him. That was, you know, point, uh, game and match or whatever the phrase is. That, we've already done it. But in terms of the points, of the, the, sec the sort of secondary level of points, he did turn up at the end. He said, he said, well, I still believe that we need to learn war and not love. But you know what? Maybe there's a point to what you have to say. Maybe. But for sure, listening to each other and speaking nicely will help. I mean, that's as far as he got on that lesson. And But the point was not that. That was a little bit of a victory. The point was that we listened. So the temptation of life is to just push on with the agenda, push on with the next stage of the class. And just so you're saying, how does it change me? How does it change the students and the teachers? We have to slow down to actually listen. Because if I don't listen to the student, I'm just phony. I'm talking about listening, but I'm not. So it's very important to be the product we're trying to present. To be the change that you want to see in the world. That's it. That's, um, it. that's the Gandhi um, phrase. Um, but what you're saying is really 
um, um, profound, what, what is profound for me is that there is a gender. Education often is about following agenda, but whose agenda? Right. My, my textbook, my, my exam gender, that's one thing. But the real agenda is where students, where the students are, their right. interest. But yes. you add another level because you can actually just go and take him away and I say, well, I just want to talk to you. But no, you basically illustrated in front of the other children that relationship, the relational process is more important than anything else. That is the agenda. The agenda is to listen. And by listening, what it is, is you maintain this relational flow in the classroom. Because by shutting him off, you cut, there's no more relationship. Right. By saying that I've got the gender, there's no more relationship. Right. But stop that and listen. Just everything you did is to enrich that relational process, which basically are you saying that as the key is the key to the loving classroom as a loving world is one of four keys one of four keys there are four h's it's part it's, it's yes yeah. but, but the thing is the relational process basically envelops yeah. The oh four. that yeah yeah so if there is um magic wand that you can all wave and and introduce the loving classroom into the system what is it that we have to change with this? Well, we're talking about the systemic level now. So if you ask for too much, you get nothing type of thing. I think on a, on a simple level, and I'd like to share with you a time saving story from a teacher, which is important. Um, on the simple level, I, I'm, I would like to see that there's one hour a week for positive relationship education in the, in the school system. I say positive relationship education because um, in England, Ofsted have come up with the idea of um, relationship education, but there you're learning how to use, um, well, how to stop bullying, as I said before, how to uh, notice signs of depression, notice signs of when things are wrong. Um, and I'm not saying that's not important. I'm just saying you need an hour a week for positive relationship education where people are learning tools so that they actually see the goodness in one another respect so that they recognize their strengths and can use it to help other people in compassion so that they learn how to listen painful behavior comes from people in pain so they learn how to be kind that the exercise that i said before so they learn about gratitude even the people in the corridor that are doing work for us to make sure the school's lovely so they learn about love etc and friendship and care so there needs to be an hour a week and if we have an hour in a week we can actually cover material in that hour and then the experience of that hour can then filter through through a process of osmosis to all the classes and so um a you're asking what do we want from governments uh, um to get going i'd like to have an hour a week where you can do whether it's loving classroom or anybody else you know one of my teachers said to me when you start doing it everybody says it's impossible once you get going everybody say i can do it better than that fine that everybody should be better than loving classes is fine by me. But whatever it is, there should be genuine, sincere, uh, positive relationship education an hour a week. Uh, and that would be a great gift. And, and then um, there should be uh, in training schools the ability to give this material over to the teachers. So that rather than us jumping in and having to train once they're already working, nice give a training course as part of the teacher training course so they can then go into school and run these sessions and and if that for me as a step one those two things would be like hell earth and i believe that once that happens then we'll see a massive and en loving energy starting to grow from the grassroots uh, all the way through to government because the people graduating from the schools become leaders and followers and politicians and religious and whatever they're the people of the generation of society so i believe that that will be a massive change just those things will enable us to create a loving society that's um one hour a week in the system that's very modest a request in a, yes. in a sense that but you have experienced even with that one hour a week, 
you can transform the culture of the school. And some training time for the teachers, yes. And training time for the teachers. Yes. And so, which is best done during teacher training, but also maybe, you know, a half a day or here and there. It has to be worked out. They can be trained. But the training process, we've got an online training. You can watch the videos, this, that. And it can be other organisations. I'm not selling Loving Carson or David Geffen. The point is, we're talking about relationship education. It has to be good training, easy to use material, pure concept of oneness. That's very important. It's not about uh, good relationships so that we can beat the other side. It's about oneness. Uh, as long as these things that we've been talking about in place, you need one hour a week for the kids and then a certain amount of training time for the teachers, so that, uh, which is not like a lot, but so that they can pick up the material so they can use that one hour a week. So I use the word modest because it, it's a very modest in terms of systemic change. But you are actually saying that we don't need to, trans to change education in a sense to kind of revolutionize an education, but we change from within the system. Absolutely. That's why I say one hour. Um, yes, I believe that the, the system will change itself then. It's sort of, it's a Trojan horse, not, but I'm saying it publicly, but this is on an interview. So I'm not trying to like hidden agendas here, but it's like a Trojan horse. Once people feel good relationships, they get into it. And then so, so if, if I push you a little bit more, maybe, you know, it's not something that the loving classroom can resolve. Um, and together but let's just vision it visualize it together envisioning imagining so right. if there is an education system that actually fully cultivate that consciousness of oneness what would it look like what would it look well, like I, I i love the question and i'll answer it um i'm not being evasive here and i'll try and deal with it directly but part of the joy and this is what you talked about earlier is not knowing the answer I don't know. And what I would like is that people are talking to each other so much that we're listening to the students, we're listening to the Prime Minister and the Minister of Education, we're listening to the businessman, we're listening to the, the, the corridor person that cleans the school, the caretaker, we're listening to each other and we're coming up with a system of education that we love. Now, what that system is, I actually don't want, I don't want to know what it is. I'm running away from being able to answer you because that will then destroy my uh, purity. I want them to come up with the answer through the process of love. So I'm not trying to, and I know things will change and I see, I see it happen, but it's got to come from them because they're actually talking to each other and saying, well, that's a good idea. I think we should, um, you know, do more of this and that. Now, I've noticed, by the way, every time I suggest an idea in a classroom, that's the one idea they don't do. So I'd be, the more ideas I don't suggest, the better things work out. But the point is um, that I, I see that when a group of people are really working together as a team, they come up with the most innovative ideas of where education's going. And I understand there are many ideas. And we could have a separate Skype on ideas for what the ideal sort of like loving school looks like and we can talk about that but i'm trying to trying to get send a different message that when you have good relationships they themselves will come up with the change and it's a systemic change i'm looking for not just little groups here of people that are loving and nice i'm looking for how you can be in north korea how you can be in palestine how you can be in israel how you can be in in america whatever the names are i want uh, all these groups can feel and we're working in Arab schools as well by Arab speaking schools as well and and so on and so forth and uh, all these groups feel that we're building real relationships so I'm looking to build those relationships not only between the kids but then between the kids and the adults parents getting involved and then between the organizations so that they come up with the solutions um, but it's all based on that idea of listening trust respect and all these basic virtues that's if to answer on a very practical level uh, the school i'm looking for is built on um the idea of respect compassion listening kindness gratitude uh, love friendship and care if we have that at the foundation of a school in a genuine way then whatever structure they come up with is going to be an improvement and it will forever improve as we improve as humanity Thank you, David Geffen. Your loving energy is infectious. I'm sure that whatever dream you're having, by having those kind of infectious loving qualities, they will become true. Thank you very much for being with us.